into number seven. And this is uh, more on pastoral, inclusion of the pastoral material, also talking about Georgics and agriculture more generally, and that's um, Cato and Varro. But let's go right into Virgil here. Um, pastoral has been around for a long time. So certainly we've seen Theocritus, third, third century, before the Christian era, Greek writer, um, he uh, puts, draws attention to it. Um, each one of these people have drawn attention to the fact that the contemporary state of the environment, even in Theocritus's period, even in Hesiod's period, sort of before pastoral, was not perfect. Virgil now is later. He's our first Roman writer. So we've done, right, we had Mesopotamia, then we had Judaism, then we had Greek thinking. Now we're making another jump 200 years forward um, from Theocritus, um, 600 years forward from Hesiod to Virgil. And he is important from our point of view because he talks about how we become aware of a changing environment. Uh, we talked about this with environmental consciousness. This is the, the first really protracted work that takes it up. And that is Virgil's first eclogue. And I, and I realize, again, with uh, Hesiod and Theocritus, not really interesting readings. I want to ask you if you found it interesting, but just so important, so important. Um, and he explores how we become aware of our environment when it's endangered or at least endangered for us. And you might think that that just happened in the very modern sense, like in the 1969 California or Santa Barbara oil spill, but it's been happening for a long time. and. Uh, We'll see that now with Virgil. Uh, for the first time, really, we're going to go through a text line by line, pretty much. We've got dealt with like large issues. So the Epic of Gilgamesh, we looked at the scene here and there. But here, we're going to go right through the beginning of it. And if we had more time, we could do that with lots of the texts we had. But this one, um, we can do it. It's not too long, and it's just so important. Uh, it, it, just to be clear, this sounds like an exam question. Um, Virgil's first eclogue, he wrote a series of uh, poems called Eclogues. You might think somehow that's related to ecology. It's not. Um, it's, it's a good thought, but if you look at ECL, that L throws you off. It doesn't come from oikos, which is what gives us the word ecology, and it just means selections in uh, in Latin. So Virgil's first eclogue. Let's jump right in. But first, did you find Virgil boring? I I, I shudder to ask this question. Uh, maybe you'll surprise me, but. My clicker is on. People are responding. I'll wait till you get a few responses up. So I, I just, I am just, I will be fascinated to see how many people select number one and found Virgil utterly fascinating. Uh, maybe there's some classic scholars. If you are a classicist, it, it doesn't get any better than Virgil. If you're um, a regular human being, it, it might. Okay. And 25 people were utterly fascinated by Virgil. 28 people, um, although I'm not sure how many of those are actually being honest. It was like a funny answer to put down. Um, but good, a little boring, basically boring, more than excruciatingly boring. And I'm um, happy to see that you've been jumping in and doing the reading. So now that we're here, you've uh, you had the reading done in advance. So. Okay, let's jump to our next part of the lecture. So you have two characters, Meliboeus and Titerus. The first eclogue is a dialogue. And the first of the two, the one who speaks first, Meliboeus, is attempting to draw Titerus's, and Titerus is his friend, attention to the environment. And he's, he's basically like gesturing to it. He's saying, Titerus, look there, that spreading beech tree. Look over there, the woodland muse, the sweet fields, the woods. Um, and he, it's very clear that in terms of like um, literal and allegorical, Titerus is all um, literal all the time. He's talking about the environment. If this were just Titerus's story, there'd be no question at all. It would be a literal pastoral talking about the environment. 
but Virgil is doing something else with this. So that's Meliboeus, the literal environmental guy. <clears throat> Titerus then responds, and you can see here, these are the lines of the text. So we just went through the first five lines. Now we're at the next five. Titerus responds by drawing attention to the political situation in Rome. So remember, these are um, Roman writers. And he remains oblivious to Meliboeus' attempt to foreground the environment. So to Titerus, this is not literal pastoral, this is allegorical, because it's talking about an environment, not an environmental issue, but a political issue. So remember, I said, you know, it's kind of confusing, you never know what kind of pastoral you're looking at. Well, hey, this one's even a little more confusing, because Virgil has both of them talking back and forth, the literal position and the allegorical, which is Titerus's position. So... Jump now to the next couple lines. Meliboeus then responds to Titerus, observing, observing some detail how in the fields everything is wrong environmentally. In the fields, everywhere, there is so much turmoil. So not only is this a literal depiction of the environment, something is really wrong. And he doesn't just want to draw attention to, look at that beautiful spreading you know, uh, beech tree. He wants to draw attention to the fact that there are problems big problems with the environment. So you think Titerus would then, you know, uh, perk up and pay attention. And Titerus, again, more uh, ignores Meliboeus and the literal environmental situation. And he returns to a discussion of his patron, who is very likely Caesar Augustus in Rome. Caesar Augustus was the patron of uh, Virgil himself. So again, he is not being swayed by this literal argument to worry about the environment. He's all about politics and um, his patron. So key point that while Mel Titerus keeps returning to politics and the allegorical, Meliboeus is repeatedly directing reference to the environment, which Titerus is ignoring. They both aren't hearing each other. The fact of the matter is you, we could focus on how Titerus is oblivious to the political, to the environmental situation. But on the other hand, Meliboeus is oblivious to the political situation. And We've only been only a few lines into the eclogue, but that's going to continue throughout the dialogue. Neither of them ever sort of switch over. Um, that's for us to do as readers, but we'll, we'll talk about that. So let's continue here with this. <clears throat> now, in terms of what we talked about with how you get environmental consciousness, how you become aware of environmental problem, Meliboeus is losing his farm. Remember how I described that last time, like if you lost a friend, if they moved away or something horrible happened, you suddenly became aware of the friend, you become aware of the friendship and see it as important and valuable and, and lament its loss. Meliboeus is not losing a friend, he's losing a farm. He is being kicked off of his farm. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and he makes clear that that loss has given him an environmental consciousness. He is now deeply aware of the farm that he took for granted, just like you might be deeply aware of that friend that you took for granted. Um, and it sort of entirely, you know, escaped his attention before. And in that sense, he was probably like Titerus. He may have been kind of like Titerus, anyhow, um, sort of oblivious to the value of what was lost, which is the environment. In that sense, this is such a milestone text, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but I told you the pastoral is important. It's the most common form of nature writing in the West. Fair enough, it is. This is the most important pastoral text, and why I say that is because all pastoral after this, or the great majority of it, will reference this text directly. Um, and by the way, Virgil knows this, and it, one of the reasons it comes across so powerfully in the text is that Virgil actually lost his own farm because of a kind of political situation we're going to talk about. He will get it back again, but not in this eclogue. Uh, so if if you wonder if he's siding with Meliboeus because it's so poignantly described, that's why. I mean, he, he totally gets the loss that Meliboeus is feeling, and he's trying to communicate it. One thing that's important to note, though, it's a little caveat here so you don't get things confused, and that is... Um, Meliboeus does not develop an environmental consciousness because the environment is changing. That's what happens with Rachel Carson, because DDT is being spread everywhere, the environment is changing, birds are dying, all sorts of life is dying. But here, 
he's changing scenes. So in other words, he is being evicted from his farm and now he's losing the farm as a consequence and he's lamenting the loss of the farm and how wonderful the farm was, which he's kind of seeing for the first time. It's a difference. He's changing scenes. The scene is not changing. It won't be till later when we see in a modern environment, in a modern sense where environmental consciousness begins emerging in the 17th century. But here, nonetheless, Virgil has, has seen the paradigm with how exile is um, doing this here. Uh, and it, it will be sort of the touchstone for how environmental consciousness is, is thought of for centuries to come. So continuing line by line, jumping ahead a little to the 30s, Meliboeus politely but pointedly notes that, Mel that Titerus has in fact been neglecting his farm. So it's not just that something is wrong, Meliboeus just comes right out and says it, and Titerus, you're neglecting your farm. You are not a good steward of that farm. You are not taking care of it. And it's a very moving line, maybe more so in Latin, but Meliboa suggests the very pines, Titerus, the very springs, the very orchards, they all called out for you. But you didn't respond. You didn't listen. You weren't there to take care of them. That's what you should have been done, you should have been doing. And Meliboa thinks that's like the highest form of behavior to take care of the farm. And he's calling out. You know, Titerus on that and saying, Titerus, yeah, that's the highest occupation of being a farmer, and you're not a very good farmer in that sense. And so, it, in a double sense, Titerus has not only been ignoring the maintenance of his fields, he's still ignoring the vir environment right in front of him. Um, Titerus is not becoming conscious of the environment. So he's he's double he's doubly at fault here, right? On the one hand, he hasn't been taking care of his farm. He hasn't been a good steward. He's not a you know good guy environmentally in that sense, but he's just oblivious to it. He's just remains oblivious, and not to be a spoiler, he'll be oblivious at the very end, he, no matter what Meliboeus can do. And it's actually kind of a um, cautionary tale. If you want to try to communicate environmental consciousness to someone, here's the paradigmatic Western example. How do you do it? How do you convince your titerus when you're trying to explain to them why we need to be taking care of the planet, why we need to be attending to climate change, and they just don't pay attention? Um, if, you're, if you're frustrated, well, here you go. Virgil has uh, did a pretty good job of describing the frustration. So in one last attempt to facilitate the environment appearing for Titerus, and that to allow Titerus to hear it calling out to him, Meliboeus launches in two protracted concluding speeches, both of which provide descriptions of the surrounding environment. So he's already called out Titerus on not being a good farmer or steward, and now he's going to take another sort of approach. In the first of these speeches, Meliboeus tries to draw Titerus' attention to various features of the environment. These are all, if you remember, the dialogue opens with him talking about the spreading beach and other things. Now he's going to do it again. He said, look at the familiar streams, the bees feeding on willow blossoms, variety of birds he talks about, and very specific descriptions, such as being willow blossoms and turtle doves. If you had any question, which you shouldn't at this point, but if you had any question if this is a literal description of the environment, this is totally literal. He's actually using descriptions of local plants, local animals, local birds to make clear that this is literal. And he's just, you know, he's, he's almost sort of like grabbing Titerus and shaking him and saying, just look at it here. Just become aware. Just, you know, um, in a 21st uh, century sense. Um, just be mindful of what's here. You're not being mindful. This is all here, and you're totally ignoring it. It's not that Titerus doesn't see it. I mean, it's right there before his eyes. He can't ignore seeing it, but he's just not being mindful of what it is that he's experiencing. So in a, in a collision, striking collision of the literal and allegorical, throughout the eclogue, Titerus responds to Meliboeus' descriptions, um, by allegorically referencing the political situation. So back and forth, and we're, we're well into the dialogue now, same thing. Titerus is just, you know, Meliboeus is sort of shaking Titerus, saying, just become aware of this, be aware, be mindful of what's here. And Titerus is talking about politics. He's just, he, he couldn't, it couldn't be clearer, Virgil couldn't be clearer um, in describing how he just doesn't, um, he just doesn't get it. <clears throat> so, 
because his farm is now lost to him, Meliboeus has, you know, and it's startling, even to him it's startling, he's developed this acute awareness of it. So he, in, in a sense, before the loss of his farm, like I said, kind of like Titerus, kind of not aware of it. You know, it's passing him by, but now he's he's totally there. He's completely aware of it. Um, he's developed what we would call what that awareness is, an environmental consciousness. It's um, That's the phrase we have. It, it comes from a few decades, quite a few decades ago, actually. But that's how we would say it. You could, you could say, you know, being mindful of the environment, being aware of the environment, a hyper aware of the environment or something. But we use the phrase environmental consciousness. So... Um, and he has, Meliboeus then has the challenge. Now he's aware of it. This is what I described last time, the challenge facing someone like Rachel Carson. She's aware of the problem. How do you communicate it? How do you use your, your words to communicate it? She does a phenomenal job. She launches the modern environmental movement. Meliboeus is pretty frustrated because he, he just can't communicate this to Titerus. Chiris, though, in fairness, and I haven't been quite fair to him, offers the political causes for his loss. So Meliboeus finds Titerus neglectful of his duty to the land, while um, uh, um, finds yet yeah, neglectful, while Titerus repeatedly makes clear that Meliboeus has neglected his political obligations. So what's going on here? So a war has been fought. And after the war, the sovereign, Caesar Augustus, is kind of an absolute sovereign here, is free to do what he wants with the land in his country. Private property is not the same way then as it was, is now. And he says, he decides to, because Titerus has been a very loyal, politically active person in the war, he's going to allow him to keep his farm. Meliboeus has not been very loyal to Caesar Augustus in the sense of like fighting the war with him and all. He's been home at his farm, tending to his trees, tending to his plants, and Caesar Augustus isn't happy with that. So, and as sovereign, it's his right to do so, he's giving away his farm to someone else, a loyalist, someone that he likes. That's the cause of the problem. Now, from Meliboeus' point of view, he's kind of oblivious to all this because all he cares about is his farm, and he's done such a good job of maintaining his farm, and he's bewildered why he's losing it. Titerus, on the other hand, tells him, no uncertain terms, this is why you lost your farm. You should have been making nice to Caesar Augustus. You should have been doing things for Caesar Augustus, and then you'd get to keep your farm like me. So there are two positions there, and they're, they're interesting, because on the one hand, Meliboeus doesn't get to keep his farm, but he was the best steward of the farm. On the other hand, Titerus does get to keep his farm, but he wasn't a very good steward of it. He wasn't a very good farmer. So Virgil wants to draw attention to that you need to consider both here. So literal and, and figurative, Meliboeus draws attention to literal willow blossoms and all sorts of other things on the farm, while Titerus speaks figurative of Rome towering like a cypress among wayfaring trees. You might think that when Titerus talks about a cypress tree, that, you know, suddenly he's talking about the literal environment. But this is a great example of, yeah, it doesn't mean anything at all about the literal environment. What he means by that, cypress trees are the tallest trees. You may have seen something like we have here in the U.S., Leland cypresses. They're like 70 feet tall. They're taller than most trees. He's saying, you know, Rome is like that. It's big and powerful, like the biggest tree you can imagine, like a towering cypress and all. It's so allegorical. He doesn't care what kind of tree it is. If there were another tree that were taller, if he knew about, you know, California redwoods, he would say like a redwood among wayfaring trees. It doesn't matter. It's just um, allegorical. So let's continue a little more with this, and then we can get to a conclusion. Virgil's larger point, because remember, you have two conflicting viewpoints battling it out in the dialogue. That's what dialogue's for. But remember, one person wrote them. Virgil, who's able to inhabit both subject positions. I mentioned because, you know, he lost his own farm, he totally gets Meliboeus's position, but he's the guy who will work behind the scenes politically to get his farm back. So he totally gets Titerus too. But, you know, it's it's not enough, according to Virgil, to explore just the literal. You have to take into account how the political situation 
may be veiled in political uh, language has profound heart-wrenching consequences to the environment. And if you stand way back and think about that, that's important because you can just say, for example, well, I am going to go to a forest and do what I can to maintain it and, and I'll live there and I'll try to, you know, uh, be a good steward and protect the place and all. That's good. There's nothing wrong with that. But in the bigger picture, you can see where someone like John Muir and other conservationists were so important because they didn't spend time in the forest. They spent time in Washington in the, with Muir and others in Washington and other places petitioning to have those places turned into national parks. So if you want to protect the forest, how do you do it? Do you do it literally, you know, living there, protecting it, or do you do it metaphorically? And Virgil, amazing as it is, 2,000 years ago, saw with great clarity you have to do both. And we often forget that because we think, you know, just take care of a place. But um, hey, politics matter. And and we've seen this in the last, not the current administration, but the presidential administration before it, where the then president tried to open up all sorts of lands um, for use for development. Um, so how you protect a place can be literal or something else, political. Um, it's, it's necessary to understand how human action, which are broadly political, impact the environment. That's an even bigger picture. How what we do impacts it, whether it's literally taking care of it the way Melibos does, or acting to see to its larger preservation. Um, it, it's, it's not enough to know that the environment was endangered by human action. We need to know how it happened and why it happened so we can keep it from happening again. And Virgil's just so clear about that, that, you know, you can just naively try to take care of a place, but you have to realize it's more complicated than that, that people will have interests um, that are, you know, conflicting with yours, and that you're going to have to deal with that. So let's jump to our next one. Many critics have argued that this is the sort of urtext for pastoral in the West. And what I mean by that is this is just, people have argued that virtually all pastoral coming after this is consciously aware of this, that is playing on what Virgil had done here. So if pastoral is so important because it's the number one way that we in the West encounter the environment and number one sort of nature writing, this one is the most important of all pastoral pieces. So let's draw a uh, conclusion here with pastoral. So first off, it's a really complex form of writing. It's um, 3,000 years old. It can be very, very literal. We saw that even with Sappho, um, come thither with me, um, or it can be allegorical. Or, as we see here with Virgil's first eclogue, it's a combination of the two, where the very literal pastoral is, is actually in discussion with the allegorical by way of two characters, which is pretty remarkable to bring these two very different ways the pastoral can work into um, discussion in one work. So when pastoral explores the intersection of uh, literal nature writing and allegory, it may, as in this case, comment on how human actions impact not just our relationship with the environment, but our awareness of it. So you may be, like Chitteris, not only impacting the environment in a, by not being very careful, not being a very good steward, in this case, a good farmer, but you may not even be fully aware of it. I would argue that when people do things like, you know, uh, want to use land for, Uses like, you know, um, um, pumping oil or like deforestation. Deforestation is probably a better example, which is why Gilgamesh is such a good one. You know, how in the world can someone have a deep caring and awareness of how wonderful and beautiful a forest is and then say, let's cut the whole thing down. Let's just strip it down. And yeah, animals are going to go extinct. It's never going to come back again. We're going to lose an incredible amount of biodiversity. But, you know, 
There's a lot of money to be made, so let's do it. It's hard to imagine someone taking that position who has a deep caring about the environment. So in defense of nature writing that's going to come, where people are trying to get you to care about the environment, they will often just do you know celebrations of it. Someone like Meliboa is talking about how important it is. So again, it's important to realize that the scene didn't change. Meliboas's farm didn't change, at least during the, um, the dialogue itself. But he changes scene. But that's okay, because it still allows Virgil to explore how an environmental consciousness would happen. But environmental consciousness in the modern sense of the scene changing, what Rachel Carson does in the beginning of Silent Spring, you know, that's, that's going to be a while coming. That's going to really be, and I'll talk about it here in a moment, um, a few hundred years in the future. Um, and that's by the time of the Renaissance. Um, poets like Ben Johnson in um, To Cookham, which is a poem that we're going to read, will adapt Virgil's approach to explore um, how, we be conscious, how we become conscious of an environment at the moment of its endangerment. And that's something that we're more familiar with, right? That's what happened when the oil spill happened off the coast here 50 years ago. People became incredibly conscious of it. And they were like Meliboas trying to tell people, you know, just something is here. You have to see it. You have to become aware of it. So that will do it for pastoral. But let's see. Um, is pastoral clear to you from that? It's been a good bit of time on it. Um, Pretty clear, basically clear. Wait till we get a, uh, a few responses before I uh, reveal. Okay, pushing 500, so let's see. Good. Good. Um, to those nine people, you should see me after class. Um, and we can talk more about pastoral. Uh, basically, yeah, that's good. I mean, I, I want you to have a basic understanding and I can tell you that a basic understanding is all you really need for the midterm. I've already made it up, so it's it's not super specific. Um, but if you are crystal clear, nothing to, um, to worry about. If you're in the C or D category, um, either seriously C or TA about it or review the material again, maybe look over the, uh, the lecture, listen to this lecture again. So, okay. So, Virgil is known for three things. Um, you may know this, he writes an epic called the Aeneid, which is uh, sort of his take on the much earlier Greek text, the Iliad by Homer. So he writes epic, and as you know, he writes um, uh, pastoral, you know, like the eclogues. But he also writes a third form that he's very famous for, which we're going to address next, which is Georgic. Um, I mention this because it's uh, another incredibly powerful form of nature writing that is an entirely different strand, but will be uh, intensely prevalent in the West. Not as much as pastoral, maybe, but very important. Um, it can be a form of nature writing. Um, it, it's different in the sense that it's not focusing on like odium in the locus amina. So what's that? What I mean by that? Like leisure in the perfect place. So in pastoral, you have the shepherd just standing around, you know, singing, uh, leaning on a staff or whatever. Georgic is different fundamentally different because it's characterized by hard work and agriculture. So shepherds are not doing agriculture. They're not plowing up the land. They're not planting things. They're not doing any of the things that you think farmers do. They're just walking around with their sheep. Um, Georgic is different. It's all about hard work. Um, let me just take a drink here. So, and again, coming out of the same part of the world, we see the same issue again. And that is, if you think about it, 
pastoral and Georgic are very similar to before the fall, prelapsarian Eden and after the fall. So before the fall, it's like pastoral, Adam and Eve don't have anything to do, Mother Earth Mother Nature takes care of them. Whenever they need food, they just reach up to a tree, grab a piece of fruit or whatever, and eat it. If you remember, God is not happy about what they've done, and he gives them a punishment, and he's very explicit with Adam's punishment, is that he has to work. He has to practice agriculture. Mother Earth is no longer going to be benevolent and take care of her. It's an adversarial relationship. He has to work very, very hard. That's his type of labor. Um, if you remember, in the, it's interesting that it does split on genders, right? Because in Genesis account, women uh, in the form of Eve also have to suffer a punishment. It's also labor, but it's labor and childbirth. So the idea is, you know, why is childbirth hard and difficult and painful? Well, that's punishment. If you ever wondered why you, uh, that has to happen, that's what God does. And his punishment for Adam and all subsequent men and that those are the vocation people, they have to work hard um, in agriculture. So um, life depicted in Georgic literature is definitely not the golden age. If you remember Heshid, it's more like, and Ovid will echo this, it's more like the what they call the Iron Age. Georgic, simply put, is modern day society. Remember, pastoral, you know, can be back in time to another earlier place, maybe way back like with Eden or it could be far away somewhere. Georgic is the here and now, and the here and now is defined by hard work. And the relationship that we have with the planet is defined by hard work. And again, that coincides with the Bible where it's, it's labor is the punishment. Um, Georgic, you know, whether you see it in the visual arts or you, know, you read it, which we're doing, you're going to see the land being worked and hard work and specific work being done. Um, the word Georgic, which comes from two Greek words, one is Gaia. You may know the, the ancient, most ancient goddess of the earth, Greek Gaia. That means the earth, but ergon means work. So what does Georgic? It means to work the earth. Again, work is central here. It's, it's the concept of it, but it is a relationship to the planet. It's not just like doing any kind of work. It's doing work with the planet, what we would probably call agriculture. Um, but that's what Georgic is. So if you think about it, this is another posture toward the environment, not pastoral, not this, you know, um, um, having the earth take care of you, but the notion that we have to take care of the earth, um, take care of ourselves by way of it. So um, you see here, two different people. So the pastoral landscape is populated by shepherds standing with your sheep. This person here is classically pastoral. Um, they're not doing anything. They're, they're leaning against their staff. They're followed by their sheep and their sheep dog. Um, it's hard to see. Is that person singing, whistling, or just daydreaming? Um, whatever it is, it's not work. That is visually pastoral. That's what pastoral looks like. Um, Georgic landscapes depict farmers working the land. Here you go in the same um, painting by um, Peter Bruegel, the elder, you have a Georgic person. This person is clearly working. They have a horse, or is that an ox actually, um, pulling that plow, that's a drop bottom plow. Um, this is made in the um, the Renaissance, but this painting, but it, it because that plow wouldn't have been um, developed until later. But you can see they're doing hard work. They're actually terracing that land. And if you've seen like terrace farms on hillsides, enormous amount of work working just, you know, with shovels and, and things like um, a plow, they're able to actually create that. But there you go. If you looked at it quickly, you would think, yeah, just two people out in the landscape. But no, two huge traditions in the West. Pastoral, the one of leisure, and Georgic, the one defined by work. Literally, you know, um, ergon gia, to work the earth. So, yeah, you think they're the same, but they're different. Um, they're actually kind of just the opposite. When you think about it with respect to the earth itself, 
Uh, let me go to the next slide and I'll flesh that out. Um, they're in many respects opposite, right? Because, so think about it, not in terms of you're out in the landscape the way those two guys are. In that sense, it's similar. But it's the posture that you have toward the planet. Is the way you see the planet as this, you know, this loving place that takes care of you? Or do you have to, in a very adversarial way, get everything that you, you know, take everything that you need? In that sense, you're working, you know, uh, um, it's going to require hard work and the earth isn't seen as, as sort of connected with you in any sort of benevolent way. You are working against the earth in a way. So two very different positions. Of course, people will say that Georgic is required because the earth just doesn't take care of people. Um, but that depends on your attitude, really. But we'll talk about that when we get to Buddhism, if we have time. Uh, the need for Georgic. Um, this is important, and it it it's, it arose for Virgil in a certain political context, and that context is kind of alive and well today. So let me explain. Um, Rome, Virgil's Rome, right at this time, became the first city in the West to have a population of one million people. So Gilgamesh's, you know, Uruk, which was an incredibly important city, um, nowhere near this kind of population. Rome is just breathtaking in this sense. And by the way, it won't happen again in the West. It happens in other places, um, but it won't happen in the West again until the year 1800, when London becomes um, has a population of a million. But for almost 2,000 years, no one, uh, no city has, has come to be the equal population-wise with Rome. But this creates certain problems. Um, and you've no doubt heard the sort of the signature things you always hear about with Virgil's, uh, with um, Rome was its wonderful roads and its wonderful aqueduct. But its food system, and that's what we're talking about here with Georgic, was also extraordinary. And these three inter these three achievements of Rome are interrelated, incredibly important, environmentally significant, and will um show up in the modern world today, too. So let me explain. How do you provide food and water for a million people? Well, this answers the question of why Rome had those amazing aqueducts, why, you know, surrounded by seven hills, water is brought in, incredibly important, it solves that problem. An incredibly, an incredible, you know, engineering master feat to do it. Um, Two, the other thing you've always heard about roads, well, the roads are there for more than anything else. I mean, you might think their travelers go back and forth. Yeah, 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 that's true. But you have a city of a million people. How do you feed them? You need to bring food to them. You need good roads to do it. If you don't have good roads, you couldn't do it. Um, but then that presents a problem because the roads are pretty good. I mean, the Roman roads were, were good. Um, for, for hundreds of years after Rome fell, they were the best in the West. But um, you can't bring fruit and vegetables too far without having a problem. You need to have a sound transportation method. And you can see where this is important today because in the United States, food travels extensively before it gets to our table. You may know that on average, a fruit or vegetable has to travel 1,500 miles to get to our, um, uh, our table. I think I brought that up before. But here, it's not that far, but it's pretty far. So the solution is, let's go to the next slide, is to encourage farming nearby. You don't want to be bringing vegetables 200 miles. If you only if you only travel 30 miles a day, you're carrying bringing 200 miles. It's like a week, and the produce will you know a lot of it will spoil that far. But they're all around Rome. There are the suburbs, suburbia, which is actually our word suburbs comes from the Latin, which means near to the city. The near to the city things are important. And the problem is, these are generally, at the time, owned by wealthy landowners. Um, and by the way, that would have been Titerus and Meliboas. These are, these are not average people. These are wealthy people. And, you know, um, the problem is, it's kind of hard to convince them to get into the hard work of farming. 
right? Uh, especially as most of these people who own these estates outside of Rome had houses in Rome too. Rome's the largest city in the world. There's lots of interesting diversions there. People want to spend their time in Rome. They don't want to be out in the middle of you know nothing on their farms. So how do you convince them to take up the work of farming, which is so essential to providing a secure food system for Rome? Um, the solution is to encourage people to take up farming. So there are two approaches, and we're going to see them both today, and one with Cato and Varro and the other with Virgil. Um, Cato and Varro, which we'll get to in a minute, is to appeal to the, your, the pocketbooks of these people, saying, you know, if you raise food, you're going to make a fortune because Rome needs food. They'll pay any price for it. You're sitting on the means of production for incredible wealth. Just do it. But then, you know, the other approach is suggesting that, um, well, let's jump to the next slide where I flesh that out. The second approach, which is Virgil's Georgics, was likely, uh, so the Georgics was likely actually made at the request, either directly or indirectly, we're not sure, of Caesar Augustus. So, you know, Caesar is saying, I want these farmers, I want these landowners to start growing food and be serious about it, because if not, Rome is going to be in a precarious situation if its food supply is challenged. The only way the city is going to keep growing is we have good food supply. Um, acknowledging that, that farming is hard work, and Virgil does it, um, he nonetheless writes a track celebrating the work of farming as honest and wholesome, wonderful work. This view of farming has continued into the 21st century. If you don't believe me, listen to some country and Western songs, because you will often have a celebration of rural country life and how it is the most sincere, best way of living, that life on the farm. Actually, I think there's a John Denver song that either has that lyric or the title, Life on the Farm, about how wonderful it is and how it's um, the, the best life to live. Life in the city, according to this view, is not good. You know, country life is good. You know, that that division is, is shaping American politics today, where there are a whole group of people saying that you know, rural areas are, you know, where values are the best and the cities are uh, not the best. Um, where does that come from? I think a lot of different places, but Georgic sets the stage for that by celebrating country life as the best life to live. So let's get into Virgil's Georgics themselves. Um, we won't go quite through it line by line. Um, they're written 25, uh, 20, roughly 29, year 29 before the Christian era, uh, a little bit after the eclogues. Um, it was influenced by older works such as He Should Works and Days, and we've read that. Um, uh, but Virgil is doing something new, and he has the biggest influence on subsequent. So even though Theocritus sort of inaugurates formal uh, pastoral in his first eclogue, Virgil totally makes it his own. But in this case, even though works like He Should's Works and Days inaugurate it in a, in a way, it's really in a formal sense inaugurated by Virgil, and he gets all the components that are, like I said, still alive today in narrative like country songs. Um, same story again and again, as in the creation myths from the Bible, he should, Ovid. Virgil also imagines a perfect time when human beings lived at peace with the planet, which provided for everything. One time, at one time in the distant past, you know, like Eden, Earth yielded all of herself more freely when none begged her for her gifts. In other words, you don't have to do hard work, the Georgic work, the earth provided for us was, you know, benevolent, kind mother, mother earth named Kinda. Um, it's another text um, in our tradition, encouraging us to believe the people once lived at earth, at, at peace with the earth. Um, so we've gotten it multiple times. And in the West, it is, it is, it is such a major strain, whether you get it by reading the Bible, whether you get it by reading Hesiod and Ovid, whether you get it by reading the um, Georgics. So 
Um, Virgil adds to it um, in the sense, you know, Virgil's a pretty uh, innovative guy. Um, he suggests that not only is this good for us environmentally, but at the in the very beginning, there were near socialist relationships between human beings. No tillers subdued the land, so there was no one with a plow cutting into the earth. He actually says plowing is sort of like cutting into the face of Mother Earth, like it's like like digging a razor across the face of Mother Earth. Um, but even to mark a field or divide it was unlawful. So hey, here's private property. You can't say, this is my field. I'm going to you know, put a stone wall around it and this is mine, not yours. He's saying that was unlawful. Everything was owned by everyone equally. This is you know, where Marx will be headed with the socialist paradise. Men made gain for the common store. In other words, people didn't work just to get a big pile of money or food in your house for you. I mean, that's the way our culture is set up today, right? Everyone works for their own gain. But he said, no, originally it wasn't like that. Everyone worked for the common store. So farmers grew lots of food. Was that so that they could fill their, you know, their coffers or fill their, their cabinets with food? No, it was all for everyone. It was all shared by everyone. The land was shared. What people got from the land was shared. And um, it's it's clear that Virgil was putting his two cents in. He's, he's very unhappy with sort of uh, early, early sort of proto-capitalist culture where his culture, where people were all out for themselves. He said, yeah, this is a corruption. Originally, it wasn't like that at all. Um, very much like the Genesis account. And again, I keep repeating these because they keep repeating in the West, but the great father himself. So in Eden, the Genesis account, that would be um, the Judeo-Christian God, Jehovah, Adonai, um, willed that the path of husbandry should not be smooth. And he made human art awaken the fields rather than have the fields spontaneously bringing forth. So why is it that human beings have to work so hard and, and you know, take part in doing all this Georgic labor? Well, the great father willed it. You know, God said, you have to do this. This is a, uh, a punishment for you. So again, not surprising coming out of the same part of the world that these stories would uh, um, collect together, but here we have it again. What's the key here? Well, if pastoral was characterized most by odium, the idea of leisure where you didn't have to do anything, Georgic is characterized by work, by toil. Toil, according to Virgil, conquered the world. Unrelenting, endless, backbreaking toil. So this is, in terms of how we relate to the earth, clearly adversarial. And even the farmer's tools, right? We would say tools like a, you know, a shovel, a rake, hoe, whatever. Um, Fer Virgil actually calls them the hardy rustics weapons. So his word, Latin word, arma, becomes our word, arms. Like people take up arms, they have uh, want to fight. Um, so to him, these are the, the, the weapons that are used to extract from the earth. That attitude will become common in the West until today, that we are in an extraction mode. We take from the earth what we want, and we're not wanting to get just enough from the earth. Um, but you can see, we already saw it with Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is totally in extraction mode. He had his own set of um, arms. You know, if you remember, he didn't take uh, knives and spears to fight um, Humbaba. He took axes. They took axes to cut the forest down. Um, Virgil, interestingly, celebrates this work as wholesome. And why not? Caesar Augustus told him to celebrate the work, to make it seem like it would be a good thing for these wealthy landowners to do, uh, to get off their butts, get out of Rome, get out onto the farms, and, and do some real work. Virgil celebrates it. Um, one of the ways that you can see, even if you didn't know anything about the, the background that we just had, why work is so important, if you just read these two um, forms, so read Virgil's Georgics, read Virgil's um, Eclogues, well, the uh, Eclogues, and remember, we just walked through one of them with the first Eclogue, there's no mention of actual work. Melibos is like, yeah, I really love my farm, my farm's great and all, but there's no mention of work. You can read all the Eclogues that Virgil writes, you're not going to see much of a mention of work. But the Georgics are very practical um, work suggestions. In fact, you could see them as 
farming or gardening manuals. In fact, if you go on to YouTube, on YouTube, if you go onto uh, Amazon, you can buy books today that are tell you how to garden, how to be a good farmer, and they'll give you lots of advice from Virgil's Georgics. Um, I wouldn't take it because uh, Virgil really didn't know what he was talking about in so many ways, but he still puts tons of advice in there. And again, he wants to make this like, um, yeah, like a good thing to do. Um, pastoral places imagined by Virgil and pretty much all pastoral writers are pretty fanciful, but the Georgic work of, you know, working the countryside of tilling the countryside is very real. So two types of scenes, one, yeah, I, I wouldn't believe the descriptions you read in pastoral. It's over the top. It's just, it's just an imagined view. And that makes sense, right? We recall that pastoral was written in the city by people who don't like what's going on in the city. And they just, you know, put pen to paper and write about how wonderful the countryside is without ever going there in many cases. And just an over the top fanciful depiction, whereas Georgic is about the actual work of the countryside. Um, so Virgil's Georgics are in four parts, and not only do they contain uh, advice, it's the central part of them. So the four books are broken into um, the first book, which we read part of or will read part of, are concerned with farm implements such as plows, tillable crops of all sorts. Um, I mean, like the things you would put in the ground, like um, plants like tomatoes or something, and orchards as well. Um, I'm sorry, the part, um, that's one and two. And then book three is related to animal husbandry. So book one and two tell you how to raise plants, all types, fruits and vegetables. Book three, if you want to raise cows, if you want to raise cows, not so much, but if you want to raise goats and pigs and things like that. And book four, which is a whole other issue in itself, is about beekeeping. And Virgil has no idea about anything with beekeeping. But anyhow, um, they have historically been read allegorically. People will try to read them that way. They're really meant to be literal, as they specifically explain how to make the implements like plows, as well as how to raise plants, animals, and bees. So they're they're very, very practical. And again, they're, you know, convince people to, um, to go out onto the farm. In this sense, they're not unique because other Roman writers like Varro and Cato, which we read, are going to also write husbandry manuals. And we'll get to those now because these also suggest a way of relating to the environment similar to Georgic, but well, scary, really scary. And if you think something like factory farms are a modern thing, Factory farms came about like since the Second World War, maybe in the U.S. Yeah, well, think again, because Varro is going to argue, we'll specifically see it, on buildings as big as this building, housing like 5,000 birds at a time. And he very much talks about how to um, optimize your profit. So let me jump right in. You'll see what we mean. Um, Varro, contemporary of uh, Virgil. Um, so if you remember, I said Virgil was writing like around 2900 um, before the Christian era. A little before that, Varro wrote his manual. And again, Caesar Augustus would have been happy with this because Varro was telling people how to produce food, to feed people in Rome. And, you know, Caesar, more than anything else, wanted a stable um, food system, stable supply of food. Um, Virgil is a poet and a very good one. And, you know, people will celebrate him as a poet for thousands of years. And he's great at, in the Georgic, celebrating how wonderful life is in the country. Again, think of him, I don't, I don't know if I've ever said it before, but think of him, yeah, like a country and Western singer who is just celebrating life in the country and making it sound so wonderful and all. Um, Varro takes a different approach. Varro is, yeah, he's by no means a poet, and he's all about profit. So, um, Varro is not the first Latin writer to take up the subject. So the, the oldest surviving Latin book, and this should tell you something about the importance of food in Rome. The oldest supplying, uh, the oldest book of connected prose 
is a um, book written by Cato, written in 160 um, years before the Christian era, so like almost 150 years before. It's also titled um, De Agricola Cultura, which means on agriculture. So it says something about this culture that the first book that they produced, of all the things that you could write about, they write about how to grow food. And it just becomes central to Rome, even though we don't think that much about it today, you can't disconnect Rome from its food system. Um, they both, Cato and Varro, again, they're not poets, they're not philosophers, they're not theologians. They don't, you know, um, they care, they don't care much that we no longer give in the golden age. They totally agree with Virgil's sentiment that toil conquered the world, unrelenting toil. So if that's the world they live in, they accept it. They're not wistfully mining for, you know, pining for another error, pining for Eden or something. Um, this is the world they live in. So let's roll up our sleeves and get to it. Um, one thing to note here, and you'll, if you haven't read Varro already, you will read it. There's a, there's a intersection here in that not only is he vicious in the uh, way that he suggests we farm, he also is vicious regarding other people. So these farms are like um, farms in the you know first half of the uh, 19th century in the US and the South built on slave labor. And slave labor is something that uh, Cato being a very wealthy, uh, or yeah, Cato and Varro being wealthy, um, people have no problems with. They totally accept that they are, and right into being the notion that they are the better people, that slaves are okay to keep. And then because these, this project, and if you're, you're, you'll get, you begin to get the feel here, it's all about profit. They give specific examples of how to do it. So, not, so, so Virgil might have launched into um, a rationalization for why keeping slaves is okay or something. They don't care about that, Cato and Varro. They want to make profit. So let's talk about slaves. How old should a slave be before you sell them? Because, you know, they work really hard, but then after a period of time, they're not get as, they don't work as hard. You can't get as much labor out of them. You still have to feed them as much food. Maybe you should be thinking about selling them. Let's talk about the calculus here to do it. Um, and they do it with vicious um, efficiency. That's how they think about it. So there is a parallel here. If we're thinking about the Earth adversary on how we can exploit it and get the most out of it, well, let's think about how we can exploit animals. We're going to see that directly. Let's think about how we can exploit other human beings. What's all the exploitation, whether it's the Earth, other beings, human beings? What's it all for? Profit. Totally profit. There's, there's, there's nothing else here but that. So more on um, um, uh, borrows on agriculture. Um, I mentioned the slavery because it's important, obviously, but also there is that parallel. Plants, animals, beings of all sort, human and otherwise, are thought of like slaves. Um, it's not new with Roman writers. We already saw in the myth of Gilgamesh how Gilgamesh was sort of objectifying the cedar forest. Uh, but Cato and Varro systematically lay out a detailed plan. So it's not that they just accept that, that that's the attitude and they, you know, the underlying ideology and they have it. They do. It's true. But here you see it unfolding. And it's also, you know, um, we're going to continue along the course. And, you know, with colonization, we might think it has everything to do with Judeo-Christian um, evangelical missions and all. And it's clearly a huge part of it. But this is not Christian or, or Jewish culture here. This is Greco-Roman, specifically Roman culture here. And this culture as well has a, um, um, a disturbing attitude toward the planet for sure. Um, these are the first factory farms. 2,000 years ago, factory farms. Um, in the example that we read from Varro, what is most important here is, is efficiency and, and marketing too, they talk about. So is it important that you have good conditions for the animals? No. Is it important that this is a sustainable operation? No. Is it important that you treat people right working on the farm with their slaves a lot? No, no. What matters here is how to be efficient, how to get the most money out of it. 
So note here, they're run for one purpose and one purpose alone, which is profit. So again, you might think that, you know, capitalism emerges in the second half of the 18th century in England. People make that argument. Um, this is clearly a culture set up surrounded, surrounding the notion of profit. Um, these are not small family farms. So the, we've, we like to fetishize small family farms in the US. It's sort of a pastoral thing, like life is on farms. But clearly, I mentioned you um, uh, the Pereseron, which is the building where the uh, birds would have been housed, held as many as 5,000 pigeons. So um, to Rome, they didn't, they didn't grow uh, or raise chickens and um, um, ducks and turkeys and things like that that we eat, but their main food was, main bird was pigeon. So you can't think of this as a small farm. Think of it as a factory, and it's a factory made possible by the exploitation of slave labor and um, the full acceptance of the suffering of, of everyone involved other than the one person making money here. Um, they're made possible through the exploitation of slave labor. All that matters is the interest of the homeowner, of the uh, landowner. Um, everything else here, anything else from the earth, whether it's the plants that are raised to feed the birds, the birds themselves, the people working on the farm, they're just a means to an end. The end is the landowner's profit. So you have a culture here with a precious few number of people and the culture is all set up for those people to make money. And they might be like what we would call the 1% today. Um, the 1% now, in case you haven't noticed, we have new revised figures coming out of COVID. Um, the top 1% of the population in the US owns 94% of the wealth. And the rest of us, not in that group either, um, own a very small portion of it. This was Rome, this was Virgil's Rome too. Very small percent, one population. One percent of the population controlled the bulk of the wealth. Used to be, by the way, that number was lower. When I was your age, it was like half the wealth in the US was controlled by one percent. Um, but owing to a variety of crises, including the budget crisis of 2008 and COVID, they just keep getting wealthier and wealthier. Um, Varro's attitude toward non-human animals is striking. Toward human beings is striking too, but, and one passage from what we read on agriculture, um, birds, he notes that birds should be killed in a special building. Uh, they should be sequestered there. And our word sequester comes from the uh, sequestarium his building. Um, and why would you want to kill them in a separate room? So imagine it's a room like this, you have 5,000 birds, why not just clear a spot and start killing them here when you need to kill them? He says, no, don't do that because the birds will realize what's up. They will realize that they're here to be killed, that the only way they're going to get out is they, if they're dead, and they become depressed and they don't eat. And remember, Varro likes his profit. Birds that don't eat, don't get as fat. Birds that aren't as fat can't be sold for as much money. So this is going to cut into his profit. So what do you do? You just come in, you get some birds, you take them out from the point of view of the birds. Maybe they think they are going to be taken out and freed. They don't know. They're not going to get depressed by it. And Virgil says, pay attention to all my little tricks. This is the stuff that really is going to make you profit. But it's clearly the case that Varro knows that these are sentient beings. What I mean by that, feeling beings. He knows they feel. He knows they can be depressed. He knows that they you know, are similar to human beings in that sense. And that realization for someone else might make you say, geez, we have to stop this. I mean, these are not, this is not like a, a plant. This is a being that has feelings, that cares, and it's like us. We should stop. Var Varro doesn't think that in a, for a moment. He says, this is a problem. How can we make, how can we keep profits up and work around this? And that's startling. And I would say startlingly vicious to, to accept that. Um, but Varro does. Uh, it's just it. Um, 
people will make and have made with Voro comparison to um, 20th century um, death camps. For sure, that that will break down pretty quickly, actually. So it's it's not a particularly good comparison to make for a range of reasons. But the core idea here is if you can disassociate yourself from the suffering of others, whether those are human beings, human beings like slaves working for you, whether those other beings are birds that you're killing to eat, if you can disassociate yourself, if you can somehow do the mental, you know, calisthenics to do that, um, that's the key to, to Varro. You have to disassociate yourself from the suffering. And unfortunately, the history of humanity has, has been marked by human beings disassociating themselves from the, uh, the suffering of others, human others. Um, so for example, uh, another little tip that Varro has, you, you should make notes on this if you ever want to raise chickens, uh, is that the first thing you should do, because you could imagine if there are all 5,000 birds in this room, when I said that, you might imagine birds flying around everywhere. Varro says, no, 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 you're feeding them all this food. They're gonna use up all their energy flying around. They're not gonna be as fat. First thing you do is you break their legs. Why? Because they can't fly around. They're all, so imagine here we have now 5,000 pigeons all here on the ground and can't even move. That's the solution to that problem. They're gonna fatten more quickly. And as vicious as that sounds, you may know uh, a few years ago, over a decade ago, California passed a law regarding factory farms and the raising of chickens. And the law is in California that if you grow chickens in a building like this, they have to have an area one square foot in size so they can turn around. Because if not, they can't move at all. They're like shoulder to shoulder and can't move. So here's the striking thing. California passed that law. Many other states do not have laws like that. So even though they're not doing what Varro says in breaking the legs of the chick of the birds, they are making sure that they can't move around and can't fly and can't use up their energy in any other way. And um, you know, before you think that California is some wonderful state, you know that that wanted to undo all that. Having one square foot to move around is still not a lot. I mean, it's it's still not a very um, uh, life that any being would want to live. I don't think. Um, we've encountered this thinking before, and I'm going to run through it um, here. If there's no prohibition against exploitation of other forms of life, and myth of Gilgamesh, you know, there's no prohibition that Gilgamesh acknowledged to keep him from cutting the cedar forest, then this mass exploitation becomes possible. Once Gilgamesh removed the, exploit the prohibition, he just clear cut the whole forest. That was it. Two, if we imagine ourselves fundamentally different from other life on the planet and separate, separate you know, creation narratives encourage us to do that. So it's not just in the Greco, in the Judeo-Christian, but in this tradition as well, then it opens up the possibility that we're permitted to do with their lives as we please. So if you think of yourself as fundamentally different, a different kind of being, and that could even be a different kind of human being in the form of slavery, that becomes an issue. So I'm gonna do one last slide, then I'll take a uh, roll. Um, if the physical realm is insignificant with its soulless being, so if, you know, uh, dogs, cats, and pigeons don't have souls, they have no place in the metaphysical realm, no place in our realm, then, you know, um, our exploitation and treatment of them becomes problem. So I'll finish the next one next time, but let's do our last, I clicker poll. Here we go. So is Georgia clear to you? So pastoral, I asked the same question. Uh, curious what you think. Everyone's gonna say, sure, it's clear. I'm gonna leave, so, okay. Yeah, so basically the same distribution curve, which is good. So, okay, so um, next time, the last lecture before the midterm, lecture number eight.